الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين خلقكم فأحسن صوركم ومن آياته خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف ألسنتكم وألوانكم الحمد لله نستعينه إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله له الأمر من قبل ومن بعد ألا له الحكم وإليه ترجعون وأشهد أن سيدنا وهادينا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه وخليله أرسل على فترة من الرسل وقلة من العلم وضلالة في الناس من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا يضل أبدا ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا يهدى أبدا أما بعد Dear committed Muslims This journey into the unknowns of the public mind, the Muslim public mind, has been an extensive one. We've tried to approach the issue of Islamic cohesiveness and togetherness from many angles. We've tried our best to highlight the positives that bring Muslims together and to diminish the differences that tend to distance Muslims from each other. And yet, we still need to do more to conquer this self-generated ignorance that locks hands with those who have information and use it to the detriment of our lives and our societies. We've quoted the ayah from Surah Ali Imran and we'll quote it again. Maybe it will penetrate. And remember, during the details of the khutbah, remember this ayah. وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا وَاذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا 
وكنتم على شفا حفرة من النار فأنقذكم منها كذلك يبين الله لكم آياته لعلكم تهتدون In a nutshell, this ayah exhorts us to be together. For all of us to hold on to the extension of guidance that has come come to us from Allah. But then, what do we have? Another ayah, reinforcing this ayah, number 46 from Surah Al-Anfal, وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْهَبَ رِيحُكُمْ Don't be at disputational differences with yourselves. Because you will fail. وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْهَبَ رِيحُكُمْ And your momentum will dissipate. You will lose motivation. You will lose energy. وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْهَبَ رِيحُكُمْ Okay, now we are going to... I know for some people, they're going to say after the khutbah, that it's unnecessary to go into the details or the explanations of what is at the root of Islamic division. And we reply that if we don't do that, then this is going to remain a festering problem that we are not going to be able to solve. And a sincere Muslim is one who takes a look at his own self, however way he defines himself. He takes a look at his own self and then begins to weed out those inclinations and those wasawis, those internal divisive thoughts that cause us now to pay very dearly, as you may see happening in the different areas around the world. One issue I want to bring to your attention is, we have quite a heroic history. We had the Kaaba itself destroyed at one time. We had Al Medina itself assaulted, and many innocent people. This was early on. I'm talking about a thousand three hundred plus years ago. Al Medina was assaulted, and many people were killed and the atrocities of war happened in, in, in those two areas to begin with. Mecca, the attack on the Kaaba, the destruction of the Kaaba. al Medina, the attack on al Medina, And then prisoners of war, and then rape, and the killings that took place. All of this we had. And then we had the occupation of Al-Quds. You think the occupation of Al-Quds today is something new? Rethink yourself. This is the second time around that we had Al-Quds occupied in the flagrant, military, brutal fashion 
that is in front of our own eyes today. We had Baghdad occupied. If you think that that coalition of the willing 13, 12 years ago, whatever it was, was the first time something like that happened? No, it wasn't. It happened before. We lost Al Andalus. These things don't happen just because we are free of error. There's something going on that causes these types of things to happen. And at the bottom of it, there's a profound psychology that brings these things on. But it hasn't happened that we have some thinking minds who will try the military history, even though we don't read, we don't write our own history, and we don't read our own history if we write it. But history bears out that there was military assaults, invasions, and occupations from Europe, from China, from other directions. We suffered from all of that. But I ask you, and this is where our minds are absent, can anyone, when we speak about military occupations, can anyone in that context, whether it's in the distant past or it's in the current present, can anyone tell us what our internal thoughts are what the khutbas are like in the masajid, what type of presentations and lectures and talks that we are presenting in public to our own selves at our conferences, at our occasional meetings in the masajid, whatever the occasion may be. What goes on when these military invasions and occupations occur? What are we thinking? Have we elevated our Islamic mind, the ayat of the Quran and the hadiths of the Prophet, to deal with these issues when they occur, or preferably before they occur, so we can preempt them? Or... Are we busy with some other topics, some other subjects? And alas, regrettably, we are busy with trivial issues. When all of this is happening, we are arguing in the past and in the present marginal topics. You can go, and I've said this many times, you can go to your masjid of choice, to your Islamic center of choice, to your congregation of choice. You pick. Go there. Listen to the khutbah. Listen to the lecture. Listen to the sermon. Listen to the conversations among those who are present before or after a Jum'ah or a Eid or whatever gathering. Listen to what people, your Muslim brothers and sisters, listen to what they are saying. And you're hard pressed to find that they consider themselves Muslims first and foremost. Before anything else. No. Here's where the problem is. They're going to consider themselves belonging to some type of madhab or belonging to some type of nationality or belonging to some type of race or belonging to some other type of whatever gathering that they feel they belong to And Islam is there as a decorative. 
It's a fancy thing that they place on that most important thing that they belong to. And then, when you listen closely to them, it doesn't matter, as I said, you take your, pick your mosque, anyone, anywhere. Of course, this is in 90% of the cases. We don't want to say absolutely everywhere, but in 90% plus of the cases, this is what happens. All of them, they are proud of their early history, whether they are Sunnis or whether they are Shias, whether they consider themselves Ithna Asharis or they consider themselves Shafi'is. However way they define themselves, all of them are very proud of this early Islamic history. And mind you, each one of them has their own way of explaining, interpreting that history. And still everyone is proud. Among all of this crowd, there are those who are frank enough to attribute their belief to that history, not to the Qur'an, not to the Prophet, to that history. And history has its faults and has its flaws. But still, they are the supremacist types. They think this is who they are and where they belong. And you'll hear names. Al-Imam Ali, everyone, whatever Islamic background a person comes from, everyone has the most honorific respect for Al-Imam Ali. From whichever school of thought, from whichever background, nationality, race, etc. But then, when you just go a little further, then you'll find that the information they have about Al-Imam Ali is not necessarily correct information, all of it. But whatever information they have, when the deeper you dig into it, the more divided you become from the other Muslim. And this is across the board. We would think that Understanding a personality like that would bring Muslims closer together. But there's something in our history, and this is where we have to do some house cleaning, there's something in our history that divides us from each other. It's not in the Qur'an, it's not in the Prophet. It's in our reading of history that we begin to feel that we don't belong to the other Muslim. Something is wrong here. And the same thing with Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. The same thing is with Imam al Hussein. The same thing is with Al-Hasan al-Basri. The same thing is with Imam Zaid. And to take it a step further, with the initiators of schools of thought. Imam al-Shafi'i, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, etc. There's no one who, generally speaking, on the surface of it, has any divisive issue with them. But the problem begins when you begin to dig deep inside the history books then you begin to realize that you're going to have to become divisive. Oh, I can't agree with the other Muslim because such and such history tells me certain things about myself and certain things about the other Muslim. So your reference point is what? The history books? Or your reference point should be Allah and His Prophet? To try to simplify this, these history books 
are in two categories, basically. History books belonging to those who consider themselves Sunnis and history books belonging to those who consider themselves Shiites. And I catch quite a bit of flack because some people, because they are the product of reading that history, they're not the product of reading the Qur'an and the Prophet, they're the product of reading that history. So they, become, they come to yours truly here and they say, why do you speak about Sunnis? Because they consider me a Shiite. On the other side, they say, why do you speak about Shiites? Because that other side considers yours truly here a Sunni. And if, I, if yours truly wanted to listen to them, I wouldn't be speaking about anyone. We probably wouldn't have khutbas. If you can't speak, then what are you going to do? Stand up and look? Nonverbal communication? And not many of those who belong to either of these two sides realize that previously in our own history we had those who were called al-Mu'tazila. They were not considered Sunnis per se and they were not considered Shi'is per se. They were an independent group. It was a very strong current at one time in the Islamic world. These were basically rationalists. But because there was a clash between them and the government ruling during the time of Bani al-Abbas, the Abbasis, they lost that confrontation and they sort of disappeared. They have manuscripts in Egypt, in El Yemen, in Europe. Their manus our history has been stolen. Their manuscripts you will find in certain European capitals, those who went into Muslim territories in the past hundreds of years and stole our heritage and placed it in their museums and in their universities and in their think tanks. Maybe if we had enough energy enough unity among ourselves, enough confidence in Allah and His Prophet and our understanding of Allah and His Prophet, we can revisit this chap, this lost chapter in our history and understand who these people were. So when we take these two segments of Muslims, the Sunnis, and basically in today's world you can break them down into, and I'm not talking in the fiqhi sense of the word, I'm not talking about schools of thought, al-fiqh al-islami, we're not speaking about that, we're speaking about doctrine. Or as some in this category of people would prefer to call it al-aqidah. And there's basically two categories here. There are al-Ashaira, and you come to an average Sunni, and you tell him, you're an Ash'ari. You tell him, what? He will exclaim, what do you mean? What do you say? He doesn't know he's an Ash'ari. That's because, once again, there's a degree of ignorance that has set in, and we don't even know who we are. Some of us don't even know who we are. So in this broad lump of Sunnis in the world, there are the Ash'aris. And the Ash'aris in a nutshell are the ones who found middle ground between the rationalists, the Mu'tazilis that disappeared, and the literalists. Ashab al-Aqil wa Ashab al-Naqil. They found a middle ground there and they were called al-Ash'aris. Pertaining to al-Ash'ari who was the, the scholar that crystallized this middle ground. 
And then there are those who call themselves as the Salafis. In the Sunni context, there are those that consider themselves Salafis. And these are the types who always, unfailingly, repeat that they belong to, quote, a Salaf as Salih, unquote, the virtuous ancestors. And they go back, when you get into their history and in their internal thoughts, they go back to the Sahaba, to a tabi'een and then from there they take on Ibn Hanbal and Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Abdul Wahhab until we wind up with today's Salafis and Wahhabis and Neo Salafis and all of these other groups that we have in our world today. Within these two sets of quote unquote Sunni Muslims, we have ignorance preponderant ignorance. A Salafi reads about Al-Ash'ari from his own history books. Al-Ash'ari reads about a Salafi from his own history books. And we wind up not knowing each other. And part of our life on this earth is to come to know each other. خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا So you come to mutually know each other. We don't mutually know each other. This is hard to say, but it's the truth. Sunnis don't mutually know each other. And the same thing, we can go flip to the other side, to the Shias. Basically, among the Shi'is, there are two groups. Just like among the Sunnis, there's basically two groups. Among the Shi'is, there's also basically two groups. Al-Imamiyyah and Al-Zaydiyyah. And they have things that they say about themselves. They're a little smarter, maybe, in one sense. Not to bring the differences out into the open. Sunnis some of them have a tendency to do that that's why we end up with this takfir issue that i'm trying to trail by this elongated introduction so here once again we have ignorance you come to an imami shi'i and ask him what do you know about a zaidi shi'i he's blank the same thing with the Zaydi Shia. You come to him and ask him, even though he'll know a little better, but still, he's sort of ignorant of who the Imami Shi'is are. And when we are ignorant of each other, I'll go a step forward. I'll say, when we are misinformed about each other, who is going to be happy with this? Who's going to take advantage of this? the people right now who are visiting us with these battles, confrontations, and wars. These are the ones who are happy. Oh, look, we can, we can go among these Muslims and stir these differences up because they don't know themselves. The, you know these Muslims, this is probably the way they're speaking in their back rooms. You know these Muslims? A Shi'i doesn't know anything about a Sunni I mean, they know what they're told in their history books. And thank God that they refer to their history books and they don't refer to their Quran and their Prophet. And in these history books, they have all of these divisions. And they say this across the board concerning all other Muslims. But they study us. We don't study ourselves. They study us. We should study ourselves to become united they study us to divide us. And who's winning? Look at the world. Who's winning? And then within these, within the, we said, as Sunnah is al Ashaira al Salafiya, and the Shia are al Imamiya and Zaydiya, and within them, there are differences. They're not all the same. And you think. These people who right now are planning, are strategizing, they don't take into, the, into account these 
discrepancies among us, these defaults that we have because we refuse. We refuse. You go to the person who gives the khutbah in a masjid like this or in a lesser masjid or in a larger masjid. Tell him why don't you speak about the real issues. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken about the real issues. Aren't you supposed to be an amplifier of what Allah Jalla wa ala is saying? Say, no brother, don't, don't bother us with this. Don't rock the boat. Live and let live. It's become so ugly. If we go down deep inside these history books, it's not the Quran, it's not the Sunnah. These are people who wrote some of their understanding about Islamic issues. And you find that the Salafis, they condemn the Ash'aris. And they give them a title like Makhanith al-Mu'tazila. The Ash'ari, because remember, the Salafis are the literalists. And the Mu'tazila are the rationalists. So the Salafis say of the Ash'aris who took a midway between the two that they are the eunuchs of the Mu'tazis. This is how bad it gets. And the, some of the Ash'a'ira, they say about some of the Salafis, and the word some should be introduced before every sentence that I previously said and that I'm going to say from now on. Because this doesn't apply absolutely to 100% of all of them. Obviously, anyone in his thinking mind would know that. But we have to qualify it because there are some people out there who listen to this khutbah electronically who are fishing for quote-unquote controversial statements or sentences. So some of the Ash'ari, the Ash'aris, they say of the Salafis, they are Afrakh al Yahud al Mujassima. They are the little chicks of the graven Yahud. There are, we do have in, in the middle of all of this, where there's an imbalance, emotionally we're charged against each other, and rationally we're empty towards each other. So, atmospherics we are living in. There are some ulama who were balanced. And when and where is it more appropriate than to, men to mention them at a khutbah? And I will. Beginning with a person who wrote a book called Ithar al-Haqq ala al-Khalq. Preferring haqq to people. Giving preference to haqq over people. Muhammad Ibra Ibn Ibrahim Ibn al-Wazir. He was about a scholar, maybe about 600, 700 years ago, at least. Another scholar who's balanced in this charged atmosphere is Saleh Ibn Mahdi al-Muqbili. He has a book by the name Al-Ilm Al-Shamikh Fi Tafdeel Al-Haqq Ala Al-Aba'i Wal-Mashayikh Colossal knowledge in, in preferring Al-Haqq over fathers and ancestors. There's Muhammad Ibn Ismail Ibn Al-Amir Al-San'ani. His book is Iqad Al-Fikra. Stimulating thought. Another scholar who didn't get involved in this emotional exchange of fire is Jamal al-Din Al-Qasimi. His book is Tariq al Juhamiya wal Mu'tazila, the history of the Juhamis and the Mu'tazilis, and another book called Al Jarh wa Ta'deel. 
So don't say, even though we are in bad shape today, that we didn't have, and I'm right now I'm not referring, we have contemporary scholars along these lines. The reason I don't mention the contemporary scholars is because there are many, many stereotypical impressions about them. I wish we were mature enough, and I don't mean we here, you and me, because this khutbah is heard by hundreds of people every week beyond us. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that many of them who tune in are mature. And we wish the overwhelming majority of them were mature enough for us to mention the contemporary scholars and ulama who have not been overtaken by this undue polarizing emotionalism. Okay, now in these books of written way back in history, we find that some far'i issues, you know, in Islam we have usul and we have furu'a. We have the fundamental issues of Islam and then we have the branch issues of Islam. In some of these books, the branch issues have become foundational issues. What do we mean by that? There are chapters that have been developed in these references that deal with a sahaba a dajjal al-imam al-mahdi al-jahr bil-basmala al-mashu ala al-khuffayn some of these references that people refer to eclipsing the Qur'an and the Prophet in which they've made certain issues, issues that define whether a person is a Muslim or not. That's how terrible it has become. So, if a certain person does not honor a certain Sahabi, he is, according to some, he is automatically omitted from the definition of being a Muslim. Where, is, where did this come from? Is there any ayah, any hadith that substantiates that? None, but it's there. This is how people judge other people. How Muslims judge, uh, judge other Muslims. At the Jal, the Antichrist, as is the the common mind on this. There are people who say, if you question the narrative about the Antichrist, you're not a Muslim. Where's this? Where do you find this? Which ayah in the Quran leads you in that direction? Or which hadith? Of course, there are, in this sense, fabricated hadith, which they refer to, but substantiated, consensual hadiths. Where? And Imam al-Mahdi, as important as that issue is, it's not an issue of divisiveness. If you encounter a Muslim who doesn't know anything about an Imam al-Mahdi, you're going to say, oh, he's not a Muslim? Al-Jahr bil Basmala in the Salah. Some Muslims they begin reciting Al Fatiha or a Surah in the Quran without saying out loud Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. They say it to themselves. What are you going to make an issue of this? The, 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 the person is a Muslim or not? Is Salah is valid? Is Salah is not valid? This is how how far we have deteriorated. And then. As trivial as this may seem, but it's a fact. In the Hanbali school of thought, at one time, good th- 
Sometimes a person, when he goes through this literature, he says, Alhamdulillah, that Muslims right now are, are not aware of some of these details of our history. But then on the other hand, you would say, we wish thinking Muslims are aware of these issues so that we don't make that same mistake once again. There was a raging fiqh issue among the scholars of a certain time during the time of Ibn Hanbal and before him in which, listen to this, the issue of wiping on al khuffay al khuff is a peculiar leather sh- shoe. Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the faqih, the scholar, said that it is permissible. Of course, if you had made wudu before that in the day, there's, a, there's little uh, conditions placed here, but at the end he says it's permissible. Those belonging to the Shia schools of thought and to the Khawarij schools of thought said, no, it's not permissible. And then an argument ensues between both sides. Finally, this issue is elevated in the Hanbali books of history and fiqh. This is a fiqh issue. It's not an usuli issue. It's not a doctrinary issue. It's elevated in in some of these historical references to become a judgmental issue. So if someone doesn't wipe on his khuf, he's suspect. Suspicion sets in by other Muslims. Why aren't you doing that? Whether you do it or you don't do it, you become suspect. This is like al-masah or al-ghusl. Of the of your feet in performing wudu issues like this. Issues that have to do with a Dajjal, Al Imam Al Mahdi. These are in purely speaking, strictly speaking, these are in what is called Ashrat as Sa'a. The indicators of the imminent approach of the final day. The final day is a Quranic doctrinary principle. يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُولِهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَرُسُولِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ One of the foundations of Iman is all Muslims are sure that there is اليوم الآخر so that, there's no argument about that. We all agree on that. Now, if we want to enter into these discussions about the indicators of the imminent approach of the final day, at the Dajjal, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, these issues, some may say yes, some may say no. So why make this an issue of you are Muslim and you're not a Muslim? Why? At that time, when Al-Dajjal and Al-Imam Al-Mahdi are present. At that time, we can see, we can understand why this becomes an issue. Because he's present. But we're going to argue this issue all the way to the war front and become enemies of each other because we have different perceptions or different ideas about it? That's what they want us to do. These Valimi, these military industrial complexes, these politicians, etc. And we fall into it. Here's where we come to a little delicate area. And that is since the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his. Since he passed away, there was a very significant political understanding of leadership called Al-Imamah. 
And the Shi'is believed in this concept. The Mu'tazila believed in this concept. But the Sunnis, those who call themselves Sunnis, they didn't, even though the word itself they have no problem with, but they haven't developed that into something like a political theory to use today's social science vocabulary. They didn't do that. They were concerned with keeping the Muslims together and therefore they don't want to go and create civil wars here and there and all over. Even though many who consider themselves bona fide Sunnis are convinced that you have to confront a ruler who is zalim. Al-Khuruj ala zulm is within this Sunni context. But it, it wasn't developed. There were no explanations of leadership and all of this. So what happened during the time of Ahmad ibn Hanbal? And this is why these Salafis, they always, you, when you read about them, you will find they're always tracing themselves back certain personalities leading all the way back to Al-Faqih Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So during his time, he said, Ta'atu wulati al-amr, these are in the Hanbali books, obeying wulati al-amr, Individuals who have authority, وَإِنْجَارُوا Even if they were oppressive and lacking justice, وَإِنْظَلَمُوا Even if they were offensive, وَعَدَمْ الْخُرُوجِ عَلَيْهِمْ You can't rise up against them. إِلَّا إِذَا رَأَيْنَا كُفْرًا بَوَاحًا عِنْدَنَا مِنَ اللَّهِ فِيهِ بُرْهَانٍ These are their words, quote unquote. Unless you see with your own eyes them committing flagrant kufr, about which we have incontrovertible evidence from Allah. At that time, it's permissible to carry arms against them, to oppose them by force. And only then. Now you come to these people, unfortunately they don't think. This is You try to tap on them to have a better person out of them, but because they don't think, you can take this discussion a step forward. Tell them, okay, look at today's world. Those who are ruling over Muslims. Isn't there a kufr bawah that they represent? But because they want to just refer to this statement and similar statements, there's another humbly quote-unquote scholar by the name of Al-Barbahari who said, and I will quote, because these problems of takfir today and the divisions and the bloodshed among Muslims can be attributed not to an ayah or a hadith, but to statements like this. It says, وَلَا يَحِلُّ لِأَحَدٍ أَنْ يَبِيتَ لَيْلَ وَلَا يَرَى عَلَيْهِ إِمَامًا بَرًّا كَانَ أَوْ فَاجِرًا It is not permissible for any individual to spend one night without having a leader, an imam, who is either bar, virtuous, or fajr, in flagrant opposition to Allah. How is this? Barran أَوْ فَاجِرًا Any one of these can be your leader? And you say that this is your reference point? Where's the ayat and the hadith that support this type of statement? And he goes on. 
Another one of the scholars that they quote, Ibn Taymiyyah, they call him Shaykh al-Islam. It's not necessary to call him Shaykh al-Islam. Ibn Taymiyyah. He says, a quote, Inna sabra ala jawa ala jawri al-a'imma wa thulmihim aslum min usool ahli sunnah wal jama'ah. Now listen to this. He says, being patient. He's talking about Muslims. Muslims being patient with the oppression of the rulers and their injustice is a foundation of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. You see where the problems arise? Where, how, where did this come from? Obviously, you're going to have governments who are supporting these types of scholars, these types of writers, these types of speakers, who are pounding in the public mind through mass media and through paid speakers in masajid around the world, be obedient to your rulers. You cannot take issue with your rulers. They give this a religious basis and a religious flavor. And then they misquote, they quote an ayah out of context. The ayah is in Surah Ashura, ayah number 30. It says, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ Whatever misfortune comes your way, it's because of what you, meaning the Muslims, not the rulers, the, Mus- the poor Muslim father and mother, brother and sister, who are struggling every day to come home with a loaf of bread and something to feed their children. That's if they can find that. It says They say this ayah applies to the average Muslim. وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ And they take that a step further. They say, the reason you have these bad rulers is because of what you are doing, meaning you deserve them. And here is where they come first, full circle. Okay, if it's what, because of what we are doing, then we have to change what we are doing. If we are acquiescent and we are passive and therefore we have these type of illegitimate rulers, then we have to step out of our passivity and we have to step out of our indifference and take issue with these. In Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah is not going to change the social condition of a people until that they change their social psychology. Allah is not going to change our politics, our economics, until we change the way we are approaching Allah through these marginal references and reposition ourselves with Allah and His Prophet. In uridu illa al-islaha mastatat. وَمَا تَوْفِيقِي إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتْ وَإِلَيْهِ أُنِيبْ Surah Hud, ayah number 88. أقول قول هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ادعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله إن الله تواب رحيم الحمد لله بجميع المحامد على جميع النعم صلى الله وسلم على مبعوث خيرا ورحمة وهدى لكافة الأمم محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم 
dear committed brothers and dear committed sisters. If you can just condense this khutbah, the first khutbah, with all the previous khutbahs before about the fanaticism and the prejudice and the bigotry that comes out of these people, these types of individuals who at the end of the day are Muslims. They're wrong, they're viciously wrong, they're deadly wrong. If you put all of that together, you can understand right now, in this the past week, we had the Saudi government who is permitted to rule because it finances divisions among the Muslims. It has passed a judgment on an Islamic scholar and activist and condemned him to death. Their legal system doesn't have an appeal. That cannot be appealed. They tell us right now it needs the signature of the king. Everything else has been done. Just awaiting that signature. And this activist scholar will be on his way to execution square. We can't look at this in a simplistic manner. You have to look at, we, we come across some individuals that will tell you, you know, we should become buddy buddies with the Saudis. There should be some type of understanding between the Islamic people of self-determination, the Islamic movement in the world, those of a revolutionary Islamic impulse and pulse you should approach the Saudis and try to figure out some amicable arrangement with them how are you going to figure out look do they give you the opportunity to do that we have people that whisper these ideas among themselves they're not brave enough to come out and say it as it is the way they think and then they react. All of these months and years, they let's come and, you know, remember at the time when there were good relations with the Saudis. And we're talking about whether these are Sunnis or Shiites. Both sides from time to time will come to you and say, let's, you know, get along. And, you know, we have a lot of things in common. We disagree on things, but there's some things in common. Let's work on those and all this. And a Muslim in his good heart and with his inclination to do what is right tends to agree with that. Yes, why not? But do they let you do something? They themselves, you're extending your hand. Will they extend their hand? That's... That's the issue right there. Why don't you look at the issue? Don't be blindsided. These are not that type. And if anyone has enough, has had enough of the Saudis, it should be us here in the, in the street. 31 years. Have they changed? Have you seen these people who rule inside the masjid? Have they ever walked this way? Have they ever extended their hand? Have they ever said, Assalamu alaikum, ever in these 32 years? Are these the type? They look at us out here as kafirs. Let's be frank and blunt about it. I think, yeah, these are kafirs. Let them pray in the street. They are the holiest people in the world. 
And here we are here, and they and they, and, and after all of this, we're supposed to make believe none of this is happening, and go to them and say, "Hey, let's get along here. Let's have bilateral agreements, and let's you know, let bygones be, and all of this stuff." This is a history. This is not just a regime. This is a history. And if you're not capable of understanding this history, then step out at least. Don't get involved. Don't become a catalyst for al-batil. The vices that come out of the Arabian Peninsula, we're, we're speaking today about a scholar who is condemned to death by this regime that came out of the history that we were just talking about in the first khutbah. That's the type of history it has. And if it begins with executing a Shia scholar, it will move on. The next one it will pick up, pick up, will be a Zaydi scholar, a Shia Zaydi. That will be followed by an Ibadi scholar. That will be followed by a Mu'tazili scholar. And then they'll come to the furthest from them. The followers of Abu Hanifa, they'll come to them. Your kafir is also. They, see, they, they don't say this in public. They say this in private. And if they have the power, and if they have the means, they'll go on and no one is going to be saved except those who tow their line. And where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Where is His Prophet? Alayhi wa alihi salatu wasalam. Where are they in all of this? They don't figure into this. And this is exactly the where the problem is. They don't want you and me to bring Allah's guidance and His Prophet's behavior. They don't want that to be involved in these issues. And they want to maintain a monopoly on Islamic centers with the finances that they have and with the, the connections that they have. Who's supporting them? Why do they serve? Why are they still ruling? There should be a universal dislike of what they are doing. And there should be a thinking Muslim mind that can take them on with confidence. Allahumma arina al haqqa haqqan wa rzuqna tiba'ah. Wa arina al batila batilan wa rzuqna jtinaba. ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا وجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا في ما أعطيت وقنا شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي ولا يقضى عليك وإنه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عاديت تباركت ربنا وتعاليت فلك الحمد على ما قضيت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر في اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمركم أن تؤدوا الأمانات إلى أهلها وإذا حكمتم بين الناس أن تحكموا بالعدل إن الله نعم ما يعظكم به 
إن الله كان سميعا بصيرا ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله 